everyone. I'm Harpreet Singh, welcoming you to the Future of Work Pioneers podcast. Today, we are speaking with Jeffrey Schwartz, a senior consulting partner and a recognized global advisor in the Future of Work at Deloitte Consulting. He is the author of Work Disrupted and a visiting lecturer at Cornell Tech's MBA program. Jeff has been the global ed- editor of Deloitte's Global Human Capital Trends Report, which he started in 2011. In addition to his recent book, he has authored and contributed to more than 40 articles for the Wall Street Journal, the Deloitte Review, the MIT Salon Management Review, the Rotman Management Review, and Wired Magazine. Jeff earned his MBA from Yale, his MPA from Princeton, and his undergraduate degree from from Cornell. Jeff, welcome to the show. Great to be here today, Harpreet. Let's begin with your background, uh, you've had a storied career and have either worked in or visited 75 countries. As you reflect back, uh, what are some of the defining moments that have shaped you as a person? Well, it's great to be with you today. That's, that's, a, that's a, a really interesting question. Um, here's one way to answer it. Um, I was asked recently, what's my superpower? It's a really interesting question to ask anybody. And I think looking back on my career, my superpower is my sense of adventure and curiosity. And I was very fortunate very early on to be open to many opportunities. Probably the the biggest departure point for me, Harpreet, was um, after Cornell, I spent a year working for a small foundation in Washington the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Foundation. This is in 1980. So I I, I say that and I think about the number of listeners who were born in 1980, but we can talk about that separately. Um, And um, during that time, we were doing a series of reports on on youth policy and youth citizenship in the United States. And I was very fortunate. We did a report on the US Peace Corps. This is in 1980. And we wrote a report called More Today Than 20 Years Ago, because the Peace Corps was... 20 years old in 1980, 1981, when we wrote it. And and I I remember doing that research and I met many former volunteers, including directors of the agency. And 201, they talked about the time that they had spent overseas living in developing countries all over the world, living in villages as the the, the highlight of their lives, whether they were in their 40s, 50s, 60s, or 70s, it was what they remembered. So the following year, I joined the Peace Corps. And I went to Nepal, um, which I joke that in 1981, when I got the offer to go to Nepal, I had to look it up in the World Book Encyclopedia because there was no Wikipedia, there was no World Book. And I really didn't know where Nepal was <laughs> on, uh, on the map. And um, um, I spent uh, about 27 months in Nepal. And I think that really started me on a career where I was sort of very open to learning, very open to being in different places. Um, and from that departure point, um, a couple of years later, as I like to say, I, I started business school and public policy school. And in 1983, I left Nepal. And in 1985, I was a corporate finance associate um, uh, on Park Avenue at Chemical Bank, now J.P. Morgan Chase in New York. So somewhere between that village in Nepal and the investment banking floors of Chemical Bank on Park Avenue, Um, was pretty much the entire world. And that sort of set me up for what's really been this great adventure in consulting and research. I've spent some time um, uh, on on some very difficult Himalayan mountain ranges on horseback. (laughs) (laughs) So I I was very intrigued to learn about, uh, you know, your mountain climbing expeditions uh, in Nepal. So, so, Tell us about that. I mean, I, what was that world like when you were there? And, uh, and, and you know, how does that, to, you know, impact what you do today? So I, um, to be fair, to be accurate, I was not a mountain climber in Nepal. I was a trekker. Um, but, you know, but I was in my early 20s. So we would just put on our backpacks with our sleeping bags and, and, and um, um, sort of follow treks that were going up to Annapurna Base Camp and to Everest Base Camp. So these are pretty high. I mean, these are 14, 15, 16, 70,000 feet. Um, 
Um, we we're pretty comfortable in staying in, in local tea houses for people who know what that means. That's basically a, a, a hut with a, with a straw roof and, and somebody who's got a pot that makes tea and, and, uh, and, uh, and rice and dal in front of it. That's obviously what, what you ate. Um, but the, the big thing for me was, and I talk about this in the book, it was a really interesting distinction, learning the difference between a mountain climber, a Sherper, and a porter. Um, and, and, and to me, this is a really interesting concept that I try to bring out in the, in the book, which is a mountain climber is a very experienced, well-trained person who often only climbs a mountain once. And in order to climb the mountain, which we, which we saw when we were in, uh, when I was in Nepal, whether it was in um, the Kumba area, the Everest area, or the Annapurna area, what we saw was, in addition to having the mountain climber, you needed the porter, and these are the men and women who literally carry your stuff, for which we are incredibly eternally grateful because you need a lot of stuff when you climb a mountain or go on a trek. But then you have Sherpas, and Sherpas, as, as many, hopefully people know, but just to confirm, Sherpas are an ethnic group that, are, that live in certain parts of Nepal. They live in the Himalaya mountains. Um, they're brought up in the mountains, and, and they know the territory, right? I mean, they live on the mountain. They, um, and they're the experienced people who guide those of us who are novices, even if we're experienced mountain climbers, how to be successful. So I, I really like the idea of the role of Sherpas, the role of people that live on the mountain, that know the terrain. Again, they don't know everything that's going to happen because the weather changes and the conditions obviously change. And, and to me, that was very, very interesting to learn sort of how to deal with these um, uh, unique circumstances and the uh, chaining circumstances. So uh, that was a big takeaway for me from those couple of years doing some great treks um, in the Himalayas. I, I spent the weekend uh, reading your book, Work Disrupted. It's a delightful read and I commend it to our listeners. So before we get into the content of the book, uh, tell us what inspired you to write it. Well, first, I'm, I'm delighted that you read it and uh, are enjoying it. Um, uh, I, I think it's a fun book. Um, I've been doing research on the future of work at Deloitte uh, probably for about eight years. I think I wrote the first article where I would draw a line between leading our talent practice and starting to think about the future of work in 2013. And uh, it was an article that we published uh, in the middle of the year uh, on the open talent economy. And we explicitly were looking at different employment models. Now, today, this is totally obvious. We talk about full-time workers, gig workers, freelance workers, contract workers, crowd workers, ghost workers. Um, it was not totally obvious in 2013. Um, and when we started talking about particularly gig workers and, uh, and the role of micro tax, it was, it was very new. Um, and a couple of years later, we wrote a piece literally titled Harpreet Machines as Talent. So this was sort of our recognizing that machines were not just tools, this is built on Tom Malone's research at MIT, but that the technology was also becoming part of the workforce, the notion of a digital full-time equivalent. And then in 2016, we actually formally established the future of work practice at Deloitte, Global Aid in the US. And what I, what I recognized was that many of the ideas that we were looking at, um, whether it was employment models or whether it was how people and technology are working together or whether it was how we think about the workplace, we were moving between what I was describing and I describe in the book as 21st century models and 20th century models. And in much of the work we were doing with our clients and many of the conversations we were having, um, we found that one of the challenges that we were dealing with is that um, we would talk about accessing talent across talent boundaries, and people would talk to us about the recruitment function. And the recruitment function, not to be critical of it, the recruitment function is designed to recruit a specific type of talent for a specific type of job with a specific type of employee relationship, a full-time contract with a company. So increasingly, the models that we were using were not helpful to solving the problems, right? And that's what led me to write the book which is, you know, what are the 21st century mindsets and models 
that we can develop that will help us navigate work and careers versus using 20th century models. It's not about throwing everything out. Obviously, a lot of stuff we're going to pull forward. But really, the book is structured around what are these new mental models around work, workforces, and workplaces. And, and as you look at your clients, what are you seeing? Uh, obviously, pandem- the pandemic's kind of accelerated how people embrace some of these new models. But are there still some industries that are more open to them than others? That's interesting, Harpreet. There are a few questions here. Um, let me zoom out a little bit and let's talk about where are we relative to the future of work? Mm-hmm. Um, and then what does that mean about adoption? What does that mean about acceleration and disruption? And what does that mean about industry? And if we don't get to some of them, you can redirect me. Um, in a recent conversation I had with, a, with a, a columnist for the New York Times, um, we were talking about where are we in the trajectory of the future of work and reflecting on both my book and sort of what's happening because it's still happening in the COVID era, which was not an event. It's become an era now because we're you know a full year into it or 15 months uh, if you chart it from where we started in China and Asia. Um, and from one perspective, from one perspective, 2020 was the end of the beginning of the future of work. It's very interesting as you're looking at this in a series called the Future of Work Pioneers. Um, to be to be thoughtful about it and a little bit provocative, I think we may be ending the pioneering stage. I think we have spent much of the last 15 years, 2004. Tom Malone wrote a book called The Future of Work in 2004, largely looking at the communication revolution. We spent much of the last 15 years to to 2020 really exploring and experimenting with the key pillars and components of the future of work, right? And, you know, we saw this in most industries. We had retail and e-commerce. We had classroom-based learning, and online learning and MOOCs and Khan Academy and all sorts of e-learning, um, uh, an e-learning explosion. Um, we had medicine where you went to the doctor and we had telemedicine. Actually, we had a little bit more telemedicine in Asia than we had in, in, uh, in the US, for example. But mo- many of these ways of working, old ways of working and new ways of working, were running in parallel. We had the traditional way that we did it and we had these experiments. In 2020, the world was fused. In 2020, these experiments became our lifelines, right? We, we actually had to go to the experimental way. We went from 5% of the workforce in the US working remotely to 50%. Pretty much anybody who could work remotely did work remotely. And the rest of us, I like the phrase, were f- we needed to be physically distanced, not socially distanced, but because um, we want to maintain the social connection, but we had to be physically distanced um, um, in our work. We saw 10x all over the place. We saw a 10x increase, as I just mentioned, in the percentage of people that were working remotely. We saw a 10x increase in um, the adoption of telemedicine, both in the US where the numbers went from hundreds to thousands and in China where they went from hundreds of thousands to millions, right? We, we literally saw 10x when you look at the numbers. We saw 10x in how long it took to create a vaccine. Right? If you literally Google how long does it take to create a vaccine, it will show you a 10-year timeline. I mean, I, I, I Googled it. You go and look at it. Right? If you look at the vaccines that have been developed over the last 100, 125 years, we had multiple life sciences companies around the world do it in less than a year. In many cases, much less than, than a year. That's, that's 10x. So we, the age of experimentation might be ending. And we're moving into the next chapter, I'll call it the beginning of the middle <laughs> or the beginning of, of the beginning of the future of work at speed and scale. And, and I think that that's what we saw in, in 2020. I think that's what COVID represented. I, I was joking with someone recently, Harpreet, that the title of my book is not work accelerated. It's work disrupted. The book work accelerated could have been written 15 years ago. And actually there there was a book I think called The Future Accelerated written uh, 15 years ago or something like that. Acceleration is not new. I mean, ever since we sort of 
followed Jeffrey Moore and he postulated Moore's law. We've been focusing and recognizing acceleration. What's new is this disruption. This, what's new is the shift that we experienced and now the choices that we're, we're trying to make. And I think it's having an impact on every industry, but certain industries appear to be moving more quickly in terms of their adoption. And we're seeing it in technology, we're seeing it obviously in consumer products, we're beginning to see it in parts of, of healthcare. But, uh, you know, so the, a, a long answer to a very interesting question, sort of where are we in the future of work and moving from an acceleration mindset to a, a disruption mindset. This episode is brought to you by Experfy. Incubated in Harvard Innovation Lab, Experfy provides custom future of work solutions, such as private talent clouds and skill taxonomies. Experfy differentiates itself by using subject matter experts to pre-vet and pipeline candidates for AI and high-end technology skills. However, Experfy Talent Cloud Platform is skill agnostic and can be licensed to build custom talent clouds for any and all skills. In a different use case, enterprises interested in employee intermobility can license the Experfy platform to create an internal gigs marketplace where interested employees can be algorithmically matched to projects, gamifying their learning experience. Visit www.experfy.com for more information. So in the first chapter, you talk about the need for new maps to navigate the future of work. Tell us why are maps needed, Jeff? Why are new maps needed? Well, new maps are needed for, for a couple of reasons. There's a, there's a great quote that I did not include in the book because I found it when we were editing the book with Wiley. Um, otherwise, I think it would have been uh, in the entry. Uh, probably in the introduction. And it's a quote from Albert Einstein, who said that you can't use an old map to explore a new world. Um, and I think that in some sense, uh, we touched on this a few minutes ago, Herbert, I think that captures the, the sort of the essence of what we're trying to explore here, which is when the world changes, you need new maps. Um, and you know, it, one of the things I look at in, the, in that section of the book is, the value of maps. Um, I love the metaphor of maps. You know, we've been mapping as a species for tens of thousands of years, you know, starting by putting maps on the walls of caves. And now, of course, we carry maps on digital supercomputers in our pockets that um, they're not really maps because in addition to showing us the possible roads and pathways, they actually show us what the options are so when I, when I open my phone and look at what the options are, if I say I want to go from one city to another part of the city, it then not only shows me the route, it shows me what the options are. Can I take a bus? Can I take a train? Can I walk? Can I take a scooter? <laughs> can I, you know, if I were in India, can I take a three-wheeler? I mean, what the options are. Um, um, and it also shows you the traffic patterns and it shows you what the disruptions are. So... Um, if we have good, better maps, we can make different and better decisions. Um, I was joking also with someone that the world is changing so quickly that having up-to-date maps, having maps that are actually in some way evolving in real time becomes really important. Um, uh, I was very fortunate. I, I lived for about uh, five and a half years in India from 2011 to 2016. The first couple of years I worked in Delhi, I lived in Delhi and I worked in Gurgaon, uh, which many people know is one of the, the major cities around Delhi, um, Noida on one side, Delhi in the middle, uh, Gurgaon on the other. And if you, had a, if you had a 10 year old or 15 year old map of Gurgaon, it would not be very helpful. <laughs> right? If you had a five year old map of Gurgaon, it would not be very helpful because the city is changing so quickly. So much is being built, new roads, new developments, new offices. So we, we, we need new maps in order to understand um, um, sort of what the terrain is like. Um, and the other value of maps, in addition to understanding what the territory is like and how crowded it is and how it's changing, is maps help us focus on direction setting. And I think it's probably among the most important questions for us right now relative to the future of work 
as we go from being future of work pioneers to future of work scalers, if I can put it that way, Harv Reid, um, is what choices do we want to make, right? Because we've shown, our, we've learned over the last 15 years about the tremendous possibility. We saw in the last year, 15 months, the incredible adaptability of the workforce around the world in terms of working in new ways with machines, different employment models, different workplace strategies. And now the question is, what do we want to do? What directions do we want to set? So it's a very interesting set of questions around the role of maps, A, to help us figure out what's possible and what the terrain looks like, goes back to the Sherpa experience we talked about, but B, to help us focus on what choices we wanna make, what directions we wanna take, how fast we wanna go, how we're gonna take people on the journey with us. And then Jeff, when you are meeting with clients, what are, what are the kind of things you're trying to map? You know, what, what are the components? Uh, are you trying to map, um, you know, where does the freelance challenge fit? Are, are you trying to map upskilling? What, what, are, the, what yeah. are the kind of things you're trying to map? Yeah, so this is, this is a great question. So um, what does the future of work agenda look like today in companies in 2021? Um, for most companies, it is a portfolio of piecemeal projects. For a small number of companies, it is a pretty well orchestrated strategy, right? And and this is all these are all public things that I'm public information I'm talking about. I mean, there's and there's a great actually case study and set of stories about Unilever's Future of Work program. Um, um, which is a good example of an integrated portfolio. But um, today it's, it's very interesting, probably the number one question in 2021 that people are asking, the sort of front burner question in the future of work is the role of workplaces, right? And, it, and it's literally, um, what does it mean to go back to a hybrid and flexible workplace? Um, so if we, if we think that there are three interwoven questions of work around how people in technology are working, a question around employment models, including gig workers, and a question around workplaces, the workplace question is front of, you know, for CEOs and for their leadership teams, it is the leading question right now. Um, but at least our view is that they're interrelated. Um, so there's a very uh, focused discussion on how to make hybrid strategies work. It's playing out in a very public way. We're hearing pronouncements of CEOs and leaders um, uh, all the time. Um, one of the things that I say in the book, it's probably, you know, some of the things I say are probably a little controversial, is it's, it's hard to predict the future, but we know more about the future than we let on, right? Because um, I think the trends are relatively clear, at least they're becoming clear a higher proportion of the population everywhere will be working in a hybrid way, right? We are not going to go back to the office routines that we had before, right? And what we're beginning to hear is roughly half the time that we spend in the office may be spent in physical offices and half the time, again, whether it's three days a week in the office or two days a week in the office, but it's roughly half the time. And, and that's the big shift that people are making and how to actually make that work is, uh, is a challenge for us because there are, to go back to where we started, there are mental models about what we can do at home and what we can do in the office, right? And, the, and I think the challenge now, the biggest challenge around workplace strategies is not choosing the workplace strategy because we can make those choices, but how to make those choices work, right? How to make the work that we're doing remotely or in coffee shops or, um, or in the office or in the lab um, or on campus productive and how to bring culture and routine and purpose into the work in different locations. And right now there's a little bit of a sort of binary view, which is in the office we have culture, at home we don't have culture. I, I, th I don't think that that's a, a good um, summary of it. I think the other, what, what's interesting is I, I really think when I reflect on the discussions we're having, the front issue is workplace, but there are, there's been a very active discussion, continuing discussion 
on the automation and AI and robots and robotic and RPA discussion, mm -hmm. which I think is a little bit stuck right now, Harpreet, in almost too much of a focus on automation and substitution strategies. We can go into that if you like, and not enough focus on augmentation and collaboration strategies. But it's, it's, it's been accelerated. It has accelerated during COVID. It will continue to go forward. The question of how do we combine people and technology is absolutely front and center, probably right behind the workplace issue. And then the whole question of what employment strategies do we have? Um, you know, what percentage of our workforce should be full-time employees? What percentage should be alternative talent, if you want to call it that? Um, um, the role of uh, what we in Deloitte and uh, research we've been doing with MIT Sloan Management Review, we have research coming out on workforce ecosystems versus enterprise employment models. All of these topics are being discussed. And in some places, they're being discussed as an integrated portfolio. And then of course, they all have implications for learning and careers and management and organization strategies. So there's a lot that goes into that portfolio and into that mix that's actively being discussed. But generally, as a relatively um, disconnected portfolio. I think the opportunity really is to bring these questions together and to look at them in a more integrated way. And Jeff, uh, you begin one of the chapters, I think it's chapter eight, with a quote from Charles Darwin, if I may paraphrase, uh, you know, he notes that the survival of a species depends neither on its intellectual abilities nor its strength. What truly enables a species to survive is adaptability in, in the changing environment that it finds itself. So what can we learn from the business leaders you've interacted with who, who've either adapted or failed to do so during the coronavirus pandemic? Well, this, uh, this is a great question. And I think, you know, now that we're a little over a year, 15 months, depending on where you are in the world, into the, the coronavirus, the COVID era, we're beginning to see more and more um, reflection on what we're learning. As you ask me, what's the main lesson I've observed around and workforces in the COVID era? It is about adaptability and resilience. And the closer you got to where the work was actually happening um, in, the, in, the, in the hospital, in the, um, uh, in the hospital, in, in the grocery shops, where manufacturing is happening, um, where in the labs where we were developing these new vaccines, the level of adaptability of workers where the work was happening is really off the chart. Actually, the, the further away you get from the work and the more you get into management, that's where we became a little bit less adaptable. <laughs> but the closer you got to the work, the more adaptability we saw, the more resilience that we, that we saw. And, and I'm hoping that that's one of the big lessons that we bring forward, which is how do we invest in adaptability and resilience? Uh, because it's in adaptability that we can create, I mean, chapter eight is a chapter where we talk about um, individuals um, and um, what, what are the mindsets that are critical for individuals to be successful in this dynamic accelerated world of the future of work. And the chapter is titled Carpe Diem, Seize the Day, right? Mm -hmm. And it sees the day because a lot of the responsibility comes back to individuals. So that we then challenge in subsequent chapters what business leaders and societal leaders need to be able to do. And then we go on in that chapter, we start with Carpe Diem, we talk about Charles Darwin, and then we talk about the first mindset, which is the growth mindset, right? Not a fixed mindset at the individual level. Right, how we imagine the world, how we shape the world, what we think is possible for ourselves. So a growth mindset, a mindset of adaptability really becomes key to this whole discussion. And it flows through to what we think educators should do. It flows through to what we think business leaders should do. It also obviously has implications for communities and, uh, and citizens and, um, and society. But adaptability is key. And I think it's interesting, one final, one additional point on this is to contrast adaptability and a growth mindset with what John Hagel and John Seeley Brown, who were the former uh, leaders of the Deloitte Center for the Edge, 
um, talked about, which is the historical focus on scalable efficiency. The historical focus on doing things at scale um, as cheaply and in the most commoditized way as possible, right? And adaptability is different than scalable efficiency, right? And what we're really trying to figure out, and it also ties back to the question of what do people do and what do machines do? And um, I don't think we yet have a machine that has a growth mindset, but I'm sure there's somebody up in Cambridge or Toronto or Pittsburgh or, or Palo Alto who's, who's thinking about that. It really is what we really are looking at are the uniquely human capabilities that are involved um, in adaptability. I want to come back to automation that you mentioned uh, in, in the book, uh, Jeff, you talk about Frey and Osborne's report out of uh, University of Oxford that alarmed many people. And I've had uh, uh, Carl Benedict Frey on this podcast, uh, and he pretty much confirmed uh, what you write about their revision to the number of jobs that are vulnerable to automation. While many people see automation taking away jobs, uh, your book's message is that machines are our friends and will create even a greater number of jobs if history is our guide. Help us understand the data you use to come up with this conclusion. So part of this is data and part of this is analysis and part of this is prediction and part of this is aspiration. So there's a whole bunch of things that go into the perspectives that we're talking about. Again, one of the things we talk about at the beginning of the second chapter, which talks about AI and, and work, is, is the, the famous, what, what I refer to as the 47% number from Osborne and Frey's research. And, and um, uh, you know, if, you, if you Google um, 47% of jobs will be replaced by machines, it goes back to their research. Um, and it created, you know, one of the main memes, if you will, um, and one of the main monikers of the robot apocalypse. Half of us are going to lose our jobs to machines in the next 10 years. You've had them on, the, on your podcast. That's not what they said. What they actually said was, we've looked at 800 job codes using a certain database um, in the U.S., and 47% and, um, of those job codes have some percentage of jobs that can potentially or likely be automated in part over the next X number of years. Or put another way, half the population should expect that some of the work that they're doing now can be done by a machine. I would actually take a more extreme view. I think all of us should expect that some of the work that we're doing will be done by machines. My prediction is that everyone should expect that they will be working next to and with a smart machine and a robot. But we're doing that in most cases today already, right? In which case the question shifts from how many people are going to lose their jobs to machines to how does everybody work with technology, right? And how do we think about technology as our partners? How do we think about, and now I really rely on Tom Malone's um, thinking about the four categories of how people and tech work together. How do we use technology as a tool? How do we use technology as assistance? How do we use technology as peers? How do we use technologies as managers? That's the one that scares everybody, but it's as basic as a traffic light or, 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 or um, shift scheduling software. Um, and, and I think the challenge in front of us, and I don't think it's a question of robot apocalypse or humanity unleashed, is how do we prepare everyone in the workforce to work with rapidly changing machines? How do we develop the unique enduring human capabilities? I don't call them soft skills. <laughs> the enduring human capabilities from early on in our lives and throughout our lives through multiple job transitions because we will have many, many jobs. Right. Linda Gratton and Andrew Scott remind us that, you know, many of us will live to be 100 and will work for 50 or 60 years. And the average time in a job is three or four years. And the half-life of a technical skill is five years or less. So as one of my colleagues said, you do the math, we're all going to have 12 or 14 jobs. So job transitions are the nature of careers. And, and the last thing I'll say, and this, I don't, this is the part that I call aspiration, Harpreet is one of the most interesting perspectives on people and technology that I've read about in the last couple of years. 
is from Eric Topol, who is a medical doctor in San Diego, who wrote a wonderful book called Deep Medicine on AI and healthcare and AI and medicine. And uh, he's a cardiologist, but in this case, in one of the chapters, he writes about the impact of AI on radiology. It's a, it's a great story. It sort of reminds me of the ATM story, the automated television story that James Besson talks about 50 years ago. We invent a machine that does what people do in bank branches. And the expectation would have been in the 1980s, you know what, there will be no retail bankers anymore because ATMs will take over the entire retail banking industry. The opposite happened. We saw growth in the number of branches. We saw efficiency in terms of fewer people there. The job of every single person in a bank branch changed. What Eric talks about, what Dr. Topol talks about is what happens when radiologists, the, some of the core things that they do can be done by a machine that can read digital scans and make diagnoses. And he introduces the phrase, and this is the one I love, of the Renaissance radiologist. What is a Renaissance radiologist? What does she do when a major part of what she did before as a radiologist can be done by a machine? Well, she can stand on the shoulders of the technology. That's the image I'd like for people to, to have in their mind. And then say, what can I do with the gift of time? Right? What can I uniquely do as a human radiologist when a big part of the diagnostics can be done by a machine? I can spend more time looking at therapeutic options. I can spend more time explaining and spending time with patients. Imagine spend, imagine having a 10 minute conversation with a doctor. Right? <laughs> In most of the country, when you, you, you have a 10 minute appointment, eight minutes, the doctor is looking at a computer screen, two minutes they're looking at you. And as you're leaving, they write a script into a computer and you walk out. There's almost no time for human engagement. I'm not being critical of the medical profession here. Um, so this is the notion, which is, how do we bring technology into the workforce? The expression that we use in Deloitte is, how do we create super jobs? How do we bring technology into our work so that we can do the Renaissance version of what that work is? And that's what makes me optimistic, but it's a lot of change and it's a big shift and it's a big disruption. Jeff, uh, we, we've been talking about uh, various work models. In, in the book, you also talk about uh, mental models, uh, if you're going to have a successful career today. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell, tell us about, uh, you know, what are some of the examples of these mental models? Yeah, so mental models and careers is a very interesting one. And the book, uh, we should mention, the book is illustrated by Tom Fishburne, who is a, a fantastic business cartoonist. As far as I know, Tom's one of the only business cartoonists, maybe the only one who went to Harvard Business School. So he's got a unique perspective. And uh, there are 25 original cartoons. Um, I, I enjoyed them very much. <laughs> in, the, in the book. And there's one cartoon where, where a father is talking to his daughter. You know, imagine a father talking to a 12, 13, 14 year old young woman. And, and he, asks, he asks her, um, so what three or four dozen things would you like to do during your life? <laughs> which is the future version of what do you want to do when you grow up? Um, and th the basic notion here is, and this is, I think, one of the really great examples of a new mindset. We, we still very often think about our careers in what's been called the traditional three box model. You get educated, you get training, you get a job in your job and your career, you get on a linear career path. You have a, clear set of gates that you go through. You do that for 25, 30 years, then you retire. Education, work, retirement. Um, that is not a really good mental model for 21st century careers. When you live to be 100, you work for 50, 60 years, you have 12 or 14 careers. I think the mental model that we're talking about, that I'm talking about, is a career as a portfolio of lifelong reinvention. It's not just a career with, with, of work it's not a collection of um, experiences. It's obviously that. It's not only lifelong learning. It literally is an opportunity to think about a portfolio of ongoing reinvention. What other species in the world gets to reinvent itself the way that we do as humans? Right? We have this gift of longevity. How do we use that longevity in a training world? So job transitions become part of that integrating work and learning and personal pursuits
become parts of that. And it has some really interesting implications for education, not just education in the beginning of our lives, but education throughout our lives. All right. And this, this really is an interesting example, Harpreet, because it connects the mental model question, um, a three-box model career to a portfolio of lifelong reinvention. It has implications for us as individuals. It has implications for us as business leaders, because we've got to build new combinations of learning and work and personal pursuits into what we do. And it also has implications for public policy um, in terms of what I call job transitions. I actually introduced the idea of transition nets. Um, what we need in our lives, we obviously need safety nets. We can argue about that separately, but we need to recognize that we're gonna have many transitions. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it with this story. It goes back to discussion of Nepal that we had early on. We talked about um, going uh, trekking in the mountains and, and being guided by Sherpas. Um, imagine going on a trek and having two mental models. One mental model is I'm going on a trek and that means that I'm going to climb up a mountain and go down the mountain and then the journey is going to be over. Right? And then you find out that the journey over the next day, the next nine hours, involves going up and down six different mountains, not one. Crossing five rivers, there's a river between each one. Half of those rivers have bridges. Half of them you're gonna go across, sorry, a couple you're gonna go across by wading and tiptoeing across the rocks, all done this. And, and one or two of them, you're gonna actually have to get on a boat or a raft to get over the river, right? It is very helpful to know something about the nature of the journey in front of us. And if you are, as we educate people who are in their teens and in their 20s, and we think about careers throughout our lives, we need to be prepared for that six or seven mountain journey, not for that one mountain journey. And, and that's an example, at least in my mind, of the value of knowing the difference between up and down the mountain once and crossing varied territories throughout our lives. So let, let's add to this, the, the, this notion of uh, career ladders that you don't see as a helpful term. I'm very familiar with Kathy Benko's work on <laughs> mass career customization, her book, uh, The Corporate Lattice. Yes. So, so how, do you, how do you see the career ladder concept disappearing? Well, I, it's interesting. I think, uh, well, th there's, th there's an interesting uh, illustration of the book where we, we, we say that careers aren't our ladders. Um, one of my clients a few years ago said that they think of their careers as jungle gyms. Um, you know, you can go up, down, different directions, different speeds. There are ladders in jungle gyms, by the way, but they're only one way of moving through your career. Um, and, and I think we talk, I know we talk about this in the book, in the, in the, in the chapter, in the discussion on careers and education. How do we see the evolution of ladders to lattices to jungle gyms? How do we see the evolution from linear careers to portfolio um, careers as well? And what I really like about both Linda Gratton's work and Andrew Scott's work on longevity and Kathy Benko's work with, with Molly and, um, and Anne on mass career customization, and as you mentioned, corporate lattices, is it recognizes that careers and lives move in different directions, not just up and not just down, but um, they zigzag and they go in and out. And being able to incorporate that zig and that zag and that in and out becomes absolutely essential, both in terms of you know, working for one company and then working another and then coming back boomerangs, people taking time to focus on personal pursuits versus focusing on learning versus focusing on work. And, and one of the core ideas that, that was developed in mass career customization that I think is really playing out now is this idea that we do all three things in life at the same time. We learn, we work, and we have personal lives, right? And the integration of those three has really come to the fore, especially in the last year. I mean, we're recording this. I'm at my dining room table. You're in your office study. I mean, we are, we, we are in our, our personal and professional lives are, are intertwined. And I think the other idea that, that uh, Kathy and her team um, shared with us about a dozen years ago is that it's not a question of are we doing 
our work or are we learning or are we, are we involved in personal pursuits? But how do they intertwine? The three strand rope is the image that I like to think about. But how do we dial them up and down throughout our lives? Right. And it's not that we dial up education in the first 20 years and then we put it on simmer for the next 40 years. Right. There may be times in our careers where we dial up learning and we dial down work because we're in a job transition. So that dialing up, dialing down, the combinations of things we do, the portfolio nature of it really comes to the forefront. I think those are ideas that, that Kathy really did a wonderful job introducing us to about uh, 12 or 13 years ago. So Jeff, one of the things that Deloitte does really well is uh, build high performance teams. In the book, you talk about team-based thinking. So tell us what that looks like and, and how do you keep teams performing at that level, keep them engaged in a remote context? So, okay, so you've asked two questions. You've asked um, something about high-performing teams and then something about how do we deal with high-performing teams in, um, uh, in, uh, in the remote um, context that we're in. Well, I, I think the, the first point here is one of the shifts that we've seen in organizational strategies, and we, we very explicitly look at this in, in the book as well, is the shift from hierarchical and functional organizational strategies to teams and networks and platforms and ecosystem-based strategies. Um, but I think we're also seeing the, in our research at Deloitte, and, and this is the way we look at it, I look at it in the book, that teams are really becoming the unit of management in organizations. The team is the thing, right? Teams are where the magic happens. Um, it's not an assembly line, um, which is obviously an important um, organizational construct, but it is the team itself. And, and so what we've seen over the last few years is business leaders and HR leaders and organizational leaders in large organizations themselves asking the question, what data do we have on teams? How well are teams performing? How do we put together high performing teams? Um, all these are areas of research that have actually been going on for some time, but I think they are really, again, moving to the fore in the way that we are managing because in so many organizations, the team is becoming that, um, that unit of analysis. And that's the challenge that we have now. Many of the HR processes that we have, and I'm not being critical of them, are based on scale efficiency and process efficiency, based on common jobs and common roles. And they're based on the individual performance with a very clear set of key performance indicators that assume that work is static, right? And most team-based work, team work is not static, it's dynamic. It's about solving a problem. It's not about solving the problem the same way over and over again. So I think there are two or three things that we're seeing that are really focusing on that. One is focusing on what does it mean to be a high-performing team and actually having data on what high-performing teams are. We could talk about that. There's some great research on that. Um, and then we also talk about what does it mean to focus on performance from a coaching perspective versus just an evaluation perspective. Um, one of the images that I think are really valuable for thinking about teams is recognizing that um, part of creating a great team is the role of the talent scout, the people that go out and find the people to be on the team. Maybe a bigger part of it is the, the role the coach plays, right? We're recording this during the NCAA finals. The women finals were yesterday. The men finals are tonight. Um, these are all great teams. They have great players, right? It's the coaching. It's how do we coach individual players to be better? And how do we coach individual players as parts of teams to be better? So the role of managers and leaders as player coaches, people that really understand the game, and can help both individuals and teams be better is really moving to the fore. So it's a very exciting time. Now to come to briefly to your last question, um, the big challenge for managing teams remotely, at least from my perspective, is to recognize that it's not the same as managing teams that are co-located in the same physical location. And one of the things that we've been learning in the last year is the importance of moving beyond the lift and shift model, 
we can't manage and coach people remotely the same way that we managed and coached them when we were in the same location. So it takes more time and more effort for especially mid-managers, team managers, to be checking in with individuals, to be setting up routines for those check-ins, and to have time to talk about both the mental and the personal stresses that people have, as well as the productive and the work stresses um, that they have. And it, it takes a lot of time. And, and really good managers are spending a lot of time talking with and communicating with staff members and team members, um, both on how they're doing and on what they're doing. Right. And it used to be very easy to do the how you're doing, because in the same place, we could almost do it simply by walking down the hall or walking through a team room. So we have to make time for that. And I think people are exploring how to do that and how to do that better. And another uh, very interesting thing you touch upon is this notion that the future of work must not only create economic value, but also foster social and communal values. Uh, to tell us about that. It's interesting. We spoke earlier about where are we in the evolution, the trajectory of the future of work. Um, I've drawn this line that suggests maybe 2020 was the, the end of the beginning. Um, I think another way of looking at it is looking at where are we relative to the questions of economic and market value and societal value. And there's a broader question, I think it's put really, really well. Actually, Mark Carney, who was the former head of the Bank of England gave the, the Reith lectures at the BBC this year, earlier this year. Uh, and he and Michael Sedell at Harvard talk about the difference between a market economy and a market society. Um, the difference between economic uh, value and business value and GDP and what we value as a society. And I think we're living in, an, in a time right now, um, you know, we've been living through a health crisis and an economic crisis and a series of social crises that, that whether as individuals or business leaders or citizens, we are, we are asking ourselves the question, does this make sense from an economic and a market perspective? And does it make sense from a societal and a social values question? And the integration and the collision of these agendas, which I personally think, it's a personal view, it's a good thing, uh, is very much at play right now. And it's driven by uh, the transparency and the level of communication. There are some issues about transparency and communication in social media, which we can, which is another discussion. Um, but it's, it's more important to our customers. It's more important to our workforces. Um, uh, I think both our customers and our workforces care that um, they're working for companies and they're buying products um, that can tell you um, how good their supply chain is and whether or not they have ethical practices. Um, and again, on the consumer side and on the, on the workforce side. Um, and that's really one of the questions I started and the book with, which is the future of work to what end? Are we asking and developing future of work strategies to simply be more efficient, to create more cost and uh, efficiency and productivity, which is absolutely critical. I, I don't want there to be any confusion. Efficiency and productivity is absolutely essential to the economic and the market side of what we're doing. But part of the opportunity in looking at the future of work is to ask, how do we improve and drive cost and efficiency? And how do we create new value in terms of new products, reaching new customers with new services and new experiences? And how do we create meaning and impact? How do we focus on some of the aspects of the future of work that may not be well reflected today in economic measures because of the way we measure the climate, because of the way we measure um, um, uh, um, inequality? And I think the role that we all have in thinking about the future of work is to have a view on to what end cost, value, and meaning, and impact are the ways that we've been thinking about it. Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, and thank you for uh, writing this book and inspiring us to think more broadly about uh, the future of work. It's been a real pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much, Harpreet. It's been a great discussion. And I hope people buy the book, and I look forward to hearing their feedback.